Hello everyone. Today we will be re reviewing expository writing, but to be more specific, we will be focusing our attention on letter and email writing. And this is section B of the long paper, or English A paper too. All right. So let's get right into it. So she said English A expository writing, letters and emails. And the reason that I chose to focus on those two is that there are two other forms of there are two other forms um, of exposition that could come on the exam, which would be a report or a notice. So I chose to focus on these first, on these first, right? Letters and emails. Later we'll do reports and notices, right? I also chose to focus on these two. Uh, I chose to focus on them together because they have similar formats, right? And the same could be said for a report and a notice well in a sense but yeah so those were the reasons that i chose to focus on these right so as previously mentioned this will be section b of the long paper and of course i have to give credit to bing images for being the source from which i obtained this photo all right so let's get into it before we even attempt to delve deeper into letter and email writing, we need to first understand what is, expo what is expository writing or what is exposition. So as you know, different types of writing will have different goals and the language will reflect the goal of the specific um, type of writing. But when it comes to expository writing, the aim is to inform, explain, and expose using facts. So the, the last part is very important. The part about using facts. So exposition relies on facts. It doesn't care about your opinions or your beliefs, right? And because it is a form of writing that is heavily based on facts, it can, forms of expository writing would include newspaper articles, letters, or even reports, because in these forms of writing, you are, you will be required to explain and inform, right? So this is what, this is what expository writing aims to do, inform and explain, right? And this is basic, this is very, very, this is very, very relatable because expository writing, expo exposition or uh, expository writing is something that is part of our daily lives because we, we often, we, uh, every day we send messages to other people. Well, of course, this is more on an, more on, more on an informal level, but it still would count as exposition. We, send messages to persons explain a situation or and giving details so that they can understand that's a form of exposition right but of course we are talking about exposition in the more academic sense right and we'll get to that point at the end because i have it here but the format is going to be crucial as you see you have letters, uh, reports, emails, etc. All of these will have different formats, even though some may be some of them may be similar in some aspects. They're still different, right? So for letters and emails, you usually use the first person, right? So the so the first person will be I or we, right? Those types of pronouns will be used in the first person. Right? So you're speaking for yourself. Right? You're not speaking on behalf of someone else. You're speaking uh, from personal experience. Right? 
So expository writing constitutes academic writing, therefore the language and tone must reflect that. Yes, and later on in this presentation, you're going to, this point is going to be more, it's going to be clear, right? But it's academic writing. So you should avoid things like contractions and colloquial language. Your colloquial language would just be informal language, which is language that you would use in conversation and not in a professional setting, right? But I would say that this section is arguably the easiest because all the information is going to be presented to you in a scenario. And you just have to put the information together, right? They literally give you all the information, but you have to put it in an appropriate format based on what the, what the scenario uh, requires. So if it's a letter, you have to put it in letter format and likewise for the, for the rest. But I would say this is the arguably the easiest section because all the, all the information is given to you in the scenario. All you need to do is know how to format it. That's all. Right? And of course, using appropriate language, like, like I said, avoiding the colloquialisms and contractions, etc. right? So let's get into letter writing. So the first thing we'll do when it comes to letter writing is we need to know how to format the addresses. This, what you see on screen is an example of the block format, which is the more common format for addresses nowadays, right? Before the semi-block format was used, where you would put your address in the upper right-hand corner and then the information or the addresses of the early address of the recipient would be in the lower left-hand corner. But now this format is way more popular and accepted. So I would recommend you use this one, the block format. So you start with your address, then you give the date, you put the date, and you state the information of the recipient. If you have a name, you can write the name. You don't always have the name. The designation or the job title of that individual, the business or company that he or she uh, represents, and then the address of the business or the company. So this is the format for the addresses, right? So before we even get into the actual writing of the letter, before we even get into constructing the letter and whatnot, we need to know how to format the addresses. And this is how we would do it. And this is called a block format. And this example you see here is actually, this is not random. This is actually taken from the example that we are going to review uh, shortly, actually. Okay, so let's continue. So, more points to note when it comes to the iterating is that you need to have a salutation and a closing. A salutation would be like there, whoever, and a closing would be like sincerely, regards, anything like that. But make sure that it's formal because once again, this is academic writing. Your letter should have at least three paragraphs, an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. So in the introduction, you will usually state the purpose of the letter and may begin to include some of the details, right? And the details of the scenario, right? The body will expand on the details while the conclusion will tie up any loose ends and bring the letter to an end. And tying up any loose ends would just mean, you know, completing any information that was not mentioned earlier, right? Or explaining anything that is unclear, right? And then it would bring the letter to an end. So that's basically the structure for a letter, right? So an introduction of body and a conclusion along with a salutation and a closing. And of course, you know, the format, the correct format, form, format for the 
addresses, right? So the, all those are important. And you can lose marks if you use the wrong format. So it's very important. So here's a scenario, right? So you purchase an item from a supermarket. On arrival home, you notice that the expiry date had passed. You attempted to return the item, but you were told that it was on sale and the manager refused to give you a refund or replacement. Write a letter to a consumer protection group or the editor of a newspaper in which you complain about the quality of the product and treatment which you receive. Um, okay, they give you the how you'll be assessed, blah, blah, blah. Your letter must be in continuous prose. This means that it must be in paragraph format. Make sure to include all details that will help in highlighting the matter. Your letter should include details of the complaint, for example, date and time of the purchase, cost of the item, specific condition of the item, and response of staff. Now, this is why I said this section is easiest because they literally give you everything that you need to include within the letter. You just need to format it appropriately, right? Okay, um, so this is the scenario, and this is 30 marks, right? Now, like I said, this, this scenario right here is, so the address, this address format that I would have shown you, that I would have shown you earlier, this is, this was the uh, format that I used for the, for that particular scenario. So this was used for that particular scenario. So when you see me start here without the addresses, no, it's not, I didn't start with the addresses. I just used the addresses for an earlier explanation, right? So just remember that these addresses right here, this, or uh, these correspond to this particular situation, okay? All right. So there, sir or madam, because we do not know uh, the recipient, the gender of the recipient. Um, but let me track back a bit. So now that we see the scenario, let us look at the address, the information. Now, of course, I will put my information here. This is my address. So I have the date. But remember the scenario required us to address it to either a consumer protection group or the editor of a newspaper. So I would have chosen a consumer protection group, the Fair Trading Commission. So if you don't, if you are not aware of any particular, you know, consumer protection groups, just write it to the editor of a newspaper, right? So whatever newspaper you know of in Barbados, we have the advocate or we have the nation, right? And you would just put the, the you, you don't you wouldn't know the name so you wouldn't include the name so you would just put if you were if you if you are going to use the editor you would put well the editor nation news and then put the address of the nation which is like Fontabel Saint Michael right John Barbados right so yeah mm hmm. Right, so I I have the manager because that's who I'm writing to. Uh, the Fair Trading Commission, that's the Consumer Protection Group, and then the address of the business, which is Green Hill St. Michael Barbados, right? All right. Mm -hmm. Now, to the actual letter. Dear Sir or Madam, right? I am writing to you because I would like to make a complaint against Jordan Supermarket for the improper treatment to which I was subjected. On December 31st, I bought a box of almond milk at 2 p.m. and I was very troubled by the condition of the milk as well as the response of the staff to the situation. So in my introduction, you see that I mentioned the purpose of the letter as well as some details that were required by the situation, by the scenario, which were 
the uh, the time, the day and time of the purchase, which is December thirty first and two p.m. The day and time of the purchase, right? And yeah, that was the first detail that I included in the introduction, right? So I just gave brief details. I don't really expand on them. And that's what I have the body for, right? So let's go to the body. Given that the milk was on sale at ten dollars, I decided to purchase it. However, when I went to consume it on my return home, I realized that the milk was given off a strong odor. Then I realized that the expiry date had passed by over three weeks. As a result, I returned the milk to, to the supermarket in hopes of a refund or an exchange, but it was completely dismissed. Okay, so in this body, you see that I explained the condition of the milk, right? And I would have talked about how I, and, and the treatment I received uh, from by the staff, uh, from the staff rather, the treatment I received from the staff. Because once I realized that the milk, the expiry date of the milk had passed, I returned the item to the supermarket and I was ignored or dismissed. So my concluding paragraph, the manager told me that I should have checked the expiry date and there was nothing that he could do. I was very disappointed by this response and I believe that it is the, supermar <clears throat> the supermarket's responsibility to distribute products that are in an appropriate condition. Therefore, I believe that I am entitled to a refund or replacement. I would greatly appreciate if you intervened in this matter. Regards, Christopher Hurdle, right? So you see, I have my closing and then I put my name, of course. But my concluding paragraph would just finish up, would, you know, finish up explaining all the details that were mentioned previously, right? And then I brought it to a close, right? I talked about how I should be given a refund or replacement, given that it is their responsibility to distribute products that are in an appropriate condition, right? And yeah, mm -hmm. so this is an example of a letter and this will be a letter of complaint. And don't think that you will only get letters of complaint. No, you can get other letters as well, but the point that I made earlier about this being academic writing is now going to be relevant because I told you even though now even though this is a letter of complaint, <clears throat> which means that you are expressing some grievance at a situation, right? And you naturally would be upset. You can't let your language reflect that. So you shouldn't be using any sarcasm or any, as we would call it, fighting words, no. Keep it professional and keep it polite. You can read this letter and see that I was very professional in my approach and my delivery. You should not write, you should not write angry letters, right? Because like I said, this is still academic writing, right? You're writing this to a business. So it is, so you must be professional. Right? So this is just an example of a letter. Now let's proceed to emails. So like I said, emails are going to be very similar to a letter in that it will have an introduction of body and a conclusion along with salutations and closings. However, the different format given that letters will have physical addresses where email addresses well, emails will have email addresses, right? So that's the only real difference. You see how I would form, how I have the addresses, the physical addresses formatted in the left-hand corner for the letter? Well, the only difference with the emails is that the emails will be dealing with email addresses, right? So, we start by saying with from, 
So we start with fam. Fam would be the sender's email address, the person sending the email. Two would be the recipient, the person who's supposed to receive the email. Then we have the date. Then we have the CC. Now CC stands for carbon copy. And this, this is used to, to, if you want to include someone, who should also see the email along with the recipient. So somebody who you would like to send a copy of the email to, you would CC their email address there, right? So as I have here, anyone who should see the email being sent. So whoever you carbon copy is going to also receive this email. There's also something called BCC, which is a blind carbon copy. Now these individual the individual are individuals that you BCC, they are going to receive this email, but their email addresses will not be present within the header. Right? So no one other than so no one will know that the email was sent to them as well. Right? So that's what a BCC would be. Now and then you have the subject. The subject would be just a general topic, and that will vary depending on the situation, right? So this is the format for an email when it comes to the addresses, the email addresses, uh, etc. So you cut, you start in the left hand corner, and you place the information like this. Mm -hmm. Now let's get into a scenario. So John Mason, a 16-year-old, wants to find out what must be done in order to obtain his driver's license. He called the licensing office many times but was, was unable to reach anyone. He decides to write an email using the email address he obtained. He must write to Mr. Kenneth Davy, head of the traffic department of the Royal St. Tabor Police Force. He wants the following information. The minimum age to acquire a driver's license, the test theory and practical which must be taken, the length of time it takes to get the license after passing the test, the day the tests are taken, the cost of the driver's license. Write the email using the information given. Make sure to include all the relevant details in the email to ensure that all the information is received. Right. And your email must be in continuous prose. Right. And then they give you how they show you how the email will be assessed. All right. Once again. The, this is the format for this scenario. All right. Okay, but I have it here. I have it here in the email. Okay, so yeah. Now, you should, get, you should use what they give you. So they give you the name of the person who is sending the email as well as the name of the person who is to receive the email, right? So it's from John Mason, which is the 16-year-old boy, right? So you would you would just invent an email address for John Mason from johnmason at gmail.com. And it's supposed to be sent to Kenneth Davy, And he's the head of traffic develop traffic branch or something like that. But they say head of the traffic department of the at the Royal St. Tower Police Force. So I gave him an email address with the domain of Royal St. Tower, right? So you know that that's who we are that's the person who is supposed to receive this email. The date of course now the carbon copy it would be Great to send this email to the licensing office, given that the licensing office was the entity that John Mason wanted to contact first. So it would make sense to carbon copy the licensing authority and licensing office. And like I said, you can come up with an email address. I use the, their own domain again, info at licensingoffice.com. And the subject requirements to obtain a, a to obtain a driver's license, right? Something general, right? I, I should say here requirements, oh, my bad. 
requirements to obtain a driver's license, but eh, yeah, that's not a big deal. So I start with my salutation, dear Mr. Davy. I'm writing this email to inquire about the process of obtaining a driver's license. There are details that I need to understand. I know that you will be able to provide the relevant information that I am seeking. So that's my introduction. I state the purpose and I state the purpose of the email. Now, let me go back to the scenario. You would have seen that the information was listed as bullet points. You do not write the email and list them as bullet points again. No, you don't do that. You have to write the construct the email in a way that you can request the information without putting it in bullet points like this. And you don't also you also don't want to be asking questions all the time, right? So you can see how I would have done it, how I will do it in the body. So first of all, I am 16 years old and was wondering if I fulfilled the minimum age requirement. Right? So that is um, inquiring about the minimum age requirement. With regard to the tests, with the with regard to the tests, I would like to know when the theoretical and practical tests are carried out. Once again, that's related to the tests that are carried out. Once I have passed my practical test, how long would I have to wait to obtain my license? So that's the question now. And that would be requesting the information regarding the length of time you have to wait after passing the test. And lastly, I would like to know the price of a driver's license. Right. Price. Mm -hmm. So that's the price. You that's that's uh, that's requ requesting the price, and you would realize that I only have one question within that body. So you have to do it in a way that you're not constantly asking questions, and you are not using bullet points because that would not be appropriate. And of course, I conclude by saying I thank you in advance for your response. Sincerely, John Mason. So you always use the information that they give you, right? Do not deviate from the information. Always use the information that they give you. They give you the name of the person sending the email, and they give you the name of the recipient, right? So when it comes to email writing, you should also use the CC because there's going to be some entity that should also see this email, more than likely, right? And as previously, <clears throat> as previously mentioned, you will see that this format is very similar to a letter. The only difference is the addresses. That's the only difference. The only difference will be the addresses, the way they are formatted, right? But everything else is pretty much the same. So this is why I chose to address the letter and the email um, together in one presentation. All right. So, yeah. So this brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope that it was helpful. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.